as you thought. Real fans, real talk, we the illest of course. Real fans, real talk, we the illest of course. Real fans, real talk, we as real as you thought. Real fans, real talk, reporting live from the cam. High in demand, so please stand by if you can. What we got is worth a lot, so put a tie on your plans. On court, talking sports through the eyes of the fans. With Trip Young, Emma Marie, Eric Sanchez. You heard what I said, we elite. Check the latest topics and stay ahead of the beat. Keep us in your topics and uh -huh. we ahead of the Yo. streets. It's Johnny Floss, bringing a different type of blend. Backing up Misfit to make sure y'all tuned in. You gotta watch, this show is one of a kind. Updates on your TV screen from 8 to 9. For the older folks, so even if you're younger, no matter what sport, this show, we got it covered. It's filmed live in the middle of BK, so ain't no better sports show to watch on Thursdays. Real fans, real talk, we as real as you thought. Real fans, real talk, we the illest of course. Real fans, real talk, we the illest of course. Real fans, real talk, we as real as you thought. Hey, what's going on, Shook Young Real Fans Real Talk? Welcome to another edition of Quarantine TV. Uh, we got a lot of sports to get into, uh, but really quick, uh, we got Legend of Two Games, of course, back with us, Eric Sanchez. And uh, we got one of my favorite, favorite guys, man, Real Lil, Jalil uh, from Real Lil TV, back with us uh, for today. We're just going to jump right in. Uh, it's a lot going on um, in the news this week, but we're going to start with the NFL and uh, those Washington Redskins. Um, after, uh, you know, some backlash from uh, Nike, who removed all of their products from the shelves and um, from online, and uh, FedEx, you know, uh, threatening to, to drop their backing as well, the Washington Redskins have finally decided to change that name. So we're going to see. But what do you guys think? They have been decade-long arguments about this name. There have been many people who protested. There's even a clip circulating now from the 91 Super Bowl when the Redskins played the Bills where there were protests during the Super Bowl about changing the name. And again, they went by the wayside because no one was affecting the, the overall checkbook of the NFL. But now that FedEx, who is the, the name sponsor at the stadium, is saying we no longer want to be a part of this and this needs to change and Nike's saying this needs to change. Now all of a sudden, the, the Redskins now are sitting down and they're talking about it. And we're seeing the same thing in baseball because now the Cleveland Indians are actually having talks about changing their name as well. Yep, Jaleel? Yeah, man, I agree with everything I just said. Um, I have a similar saying to Eric. Uh, I, I think when there's money to be made, things will get done. And I think that uh, because they were losing money, that's, that, that caused the push to at least consider this change. And when you think about it, I think that uh, because this has been going back and forth for so long, it almost turned the Redskins into this dysfunctional franchise. And it translated to just how dysfunctional that franchise is not being able to win and get to the playoffs. I think a lot of that, a lot of that has something to do with that. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, it sucks that it took this long um, to actually get it done, and that it, it it really did. It took the money, you know, or you know, or money being cut in order for this change to be made. Because I mean, it, it's real simple. It's listen, this if this is if we're supposed to be all equal, and this name is offensive to a certain group of people. I don't understand what's so hard about just changing the name. You know, I get it. It's part of the history of the team. They've, they've been known as Redskins. Again, like you said, they had a Super Bowl. Uh, you know, shout out to uh, Doug Williams, the first black quarterback to, uh, to to start and win a Super Bowl. So, you know, there's, there's history there. But at the same time, it's a history of being offensive as well. So it shouldn't have taken this long. But, you know, I thankfully, you know, Nike, who's been, you know, they Nike's been very – uh good, you know what I'm saying, especially with, with, with working with Kaepernick and what they've been doing for social injustice, but now FedEx to now step up and say, listen, we ain't gonna we ain't rocking out with y'all no more. If y'all don't change this ASAP, you gonna you gonna you're gonna lose a big part of your financial backing. And again, they that's the stadium. They would they've been talking about having to get a new stadium. So none of that stuff is gonna go down if that name isn't changed. So I'm definitely glad that, that FedEx and Nike have both stepped up and put their money where their mouth is, so to speak. Yeah, I think the athletes should do the same thing too. Um, if I was an athlete and I played for the Redskins and I was one of their star players, you wouldn't be seeing me playing if they didn't change the name. So I think that a lot of athletes are um, starting to take advantage of their platforms and use it to spark these changes. And I think corporations will follow as well. Yeah, I mean, it's... It's, it's easier said than done when it comes to the athletes. And you're right, Leo, because with the bigger name guys who have more guaranteed money, it's easier to say, hey, I'm going to sit out and I'm not going to play. 
But it's very tough for that guy who was an undrafted rookie who's trying to make the team to say, I'm not going to play because he already has the card stacked against him. You know what I'm saying? So it, it does require the bigger names with the bigger platforms to stand up first because then it makes it easier for those guys behind them to follow that lead. Anything about Missouri too? Missouri, they they hold it out and they got whatever they had. They had the situation. They got to handle it within a week. Right. So I think that um and these players don't make money um on Missouri obviously too and they trying to make money. So I think that at least they could definitely get the job done. But I do agree with you. Um, it's up to the bigger athletes with the bigger paychecks to do these things. Yeah, thankfully, you know, I, th- I think now more so, you know, well, recently actually within the past couple of weeks. Athletes are really taking advantage of the power uh, that they that they hold. Um, you know, it was great. We spoke about uh, JJ Watt a couple uh, a couple of weeks ago, and um, you know, stepping up and saying that he was going to kneel with the rest of the players. So it's great now seeing the players, the ones that they put the video together. Just we need that from the players. We need for those guys because those guys, like you said, will make it easier for the guy who's on the tail end of the bench. He might be wavering between the practice squad and, and coming up, so he can't necessarily just jump all the way out the window. But if if you got the the the, the Aaron Rodgers, who's been very well spoken, you know you got you got your, your your Patrick Mahomes, all of those guys speaking up, it makes it easier for the guys you know who who don't have that type of, of money. And again, it's football, which is probably as far as the, the four major sports: oh, MLB, NBA. NHL and NFL is probably the worst as far as contracts go uh, for players and whatnot because for the most part, I think there may be there's probably less than 10 guys that maybe have fully guaranteed contracts in the NFL. Everybody else, you know what I'm saying, like they got to actually play and be out on that field in order to, to get the checks coming in. Yeah, and in the NFL, a lot of people forget that the lifespan of a career is much shorter. Um, on average, NFL players really only in the league for about three and a half to four years. Um, so as you mentioned, a lot of those guys don't even get that next big contract that has all the guaranteed money in it. It's a lot of times as you maxed out on that rookie deal and then you never get another chance. Um, but I do, I, I think we need to continue to acknowledge and highlight guys like J.J. Watt, like Aaron Rodgers, like Baker Mayfield, because as we know with this movement, in order for it to push forward, we need the white athletes to stand up and speak as well it just can't continue to be the black athlete speaking because then it falls on deaf ears because we know that the owners and the, and the front office types that we're speaking to are all white. So we need the guys that they relate to, to speak up as well and say, this is wrong. This needs to change. So I, I am very interested to see um, who stands on their word coming up this season, who's going to continue to be there for the movement. Once things start to settle down and get back to normalcy, because as we know, it's easy to be an activist right now. Show me that same level of effort come September, October, November, when things are slowly dying down within the culture and the community. Exactly. And I totally agree because it wasn't so easy to be an activist when Colin Kaepernick was taking a knee. So as I'm concerned, I only saw three, like two, three other athletes in the NFL that was taking a knee when he was doing it. Everybody was getting straight. I mean, so, you know, now it seems like it's a popular trend right now. And I'm happy it is. Don't get me wrong. I think it's better late than never. But like you said, let's see what happens a couple months from now. Yeah, no, absolutely. You know, again, like a shout out to uh, Baker Mayfield as well. He's another one of the, you know, the white athletes that stepped up and said that he's he's going to nail uh, with the players if that's what they what they choose to do going into the season. Um, but again, yeah, you you, you got to get to these owners, and, it's, and it takes more, which is which is crazy because when you think about the NFL, is seventy three percent of the players are African American, so you think that that would be enough, but it's it's just not, and that's the sad part about it. We need our white counterparts to to step up. Shout out to Chris Long, uh, who's who's always been you know very uh, vocal, very forward, kneeling and, and whatnot, very supportive uh, of the movement. And it's it's sad you know because he is a white player, but he doesn't have that level of fame that it that it takes. You know, it's got to be the Tom Brady's, the Aaron Rodgers. You know, what I'm saying those guys. And then you know when you when you do come across the Drew Breeses, who may be a little ignorant on on certain things. Those kind of things can hurt, you know. Fortunately, he kind of I, – I feel like he did learn, um, you know, from the statements that he made a couple of weeks ago, and he's been working to change, but it's, but it's not enough. You need you need all of these guys to, to, to be involved. And shout, and shout out to guys like Trevor Lawrence, guys that are in college that are these big name um, guys that's going to be in the NFL next year. Trevor Lawrence is my guy. For him to almost be smarter than his coach that don't know how to wear a white T-shirt – 
or any other T-shirt other than Football Matters. Shout out to guys like Trevor Lawrence that shows a level of maturity before even getting into the NFL. Absolutely. I, I think we're seeing a level of consciousness um, all across the board that I don't think we've ever seen before. You know, there, as you mentioned, there are a lot of college athletes because we're seeing not only Trevor Lawrence, but other football teams, Mississippi State, Missouri, where the players are speaking up and saying this isn't right. And we're not just going to shut up and play football. We're going to voice our opinions. We're going to let you know what's going on right now. And um, that's why I truly believe what we're seeing now in the movement is different than what we've seen in the past. Granted, it may have taken this perfect storm of COVID, um, of, of everything that's taken place in 2020 for it to happen. But it is happening. And let's hope it continues to happen. Yeah, absolutely. And again, you know, everything that's been going on with, with, with the social, you know, injustices in this country, just an add on to, you know, the, the COVID just added on to everything with that, which, you know, it, it was kind of the gift and the curse because, you know, everything being slowed down by COVID really made people have to sit and, and see what's been going on in this country because there is literally nothing else that you can do. I know things now have opened up a little bit more, but there's really, you know what I'm saying, once when everything got shut down and people had to stay home, you were kind of forced to really look into these issues. And then when you when you see Ahmaud Auburn, you know, Breonna Taylor and George Floyd back to back to back and there's no nothing else going on that's gonna stop you from seeing that, you gotta watch, you gotta open your eyes. A lot of people have been opening their eyes. That's why we've been seeing a lot of these statues being removed. We actually, we spoke about the statue in front of the uh, the, the Redskins uh, Stadium last week being removed. We spoke about the twin statue uh, being being removed as well. So you know, there's there's a lot going on. But COVID actually opened it up, opened the, the eyes of the people um, to everything that's been going on. It's also um, had the NFL take away two of the preseason games. So going into this season, if there's an NFL season, we're already um, – two preseason games will be removed. However, the players are trying to have the preseason uh, removed completely, uh, which I definitely get just because, you know, we're still in the, in the belly of the beach with this whole COVID thing. Uh, we've been seeing spikes all across the country. Thankfully, uh, you know, in New York, you know, the numbers have, you know, stayed down. But across the Texas – uh, Florida, Georgia, you know, several different states across the country, the numbers are rising back up. So, you know, the less preseason games, which are really just meaningless games anyway, they don't count for anybody's stats. They don't count towards the season. So those games, you know, if you remove the whole preseason, you know, it's whatever. I just want to want to see a season. <laughs> yeah, um, I, I totally agree with you with that. I definitely want to see a season. But um, I agree with the players that want to see the preseason eliminated. Um, you t you heard about Anthony Fauci and his um comments that football may not happen this year or they need a bubble format in order to make this work. Um, the NFL and a lot of these other sports are playing um within the lines here and they're taking a, a big risk by trying to start the season. So I think that because you limit um the amount of games being played as much as possible, I think that it, it will go well for the NBA, um NFL, especially if these games don't matter. Why not do um take a page out of the college football playbook? They don't play any preseason games. They have they they workouts, they spring camp, they fall camp, and they get right to the action. So I think the NFL definitely should look into that. Yeah, it's it's gonna be tough. I'm gonna be honest. Um, when I first heard the news about the preseason, and it started with them canceling the Hall of Fame game, which to me was like the first telltale sign that they weren't confident about getting the season started on time because the Hall of Fame game kicks off their preseason, and now we're hearing they're only gonna do two preseason games. I'm skeptical that they're gonna start on time. I just think that we got to keep in mind that we're in July. These teams haven't had a chance to have any OTAs, haven't had any workouts yet. And so to think that they're going to be ready to go in September without any contact, without any tackling, without any drills, if even if you do put the season, you're putting a lot of guys at risk of injury because we see it every year in the preseason how many guys get injured just working out. So to think that you're just going to get on the field and play, I think is, is very, very risky by the NFL. And I'm getting a little skeptical that they're going to be able to start on time. For the players, I agree. They've been wanting to eliminate preseason for quite some time. Um, you know, they even tried to negotiate it recently as the NFL was trying to add a 17th game. The players are saying, well, then take away these preseason games. If we're going to play 17 regular season, we don't need to be playing four preseason games, um, along with the addition of a new playoff game, along with these Thursday night games. So I think the NFL is in a very tricky spot of figuring out how to get this off, off the ground and, and running in time with all these other aspects. Um, just floating around and, and like I said still with the risk of injury that takes place 
Um, and I, I'm be honest, like I said, I don't, I don't know if they're going to be able to start on time or even have a season. Yeah, because I think uh, you know football is probably the toughest sport to protect the the players from as far as everything going on with COVID, just because there's so many people on the field at one time. You know, with basketball, you got five on five, so it's like all right, you can kind of somewhat contain that. Baseball, I mean. Guys don't really touch each other in baseball anyway unless you're trying to tag a man out, you know, on the base. Mm-hmm. So it's a little little easier. And then even with hockey, I mean, they all wear face masks anyway, you know, covering – this whole thing is covered up. Um, but I don't know. With football, it's, it's, it's going to be tough. Um, they, they, they got a lot that they're going to have to work out. And I know a lot of players um, have been testing positive for COVID. So I don't know how you do an NFL bubble – just because there are so many people right. on the team. NBA, in regards to COVID, the NBA had an advantage because their season was already going. So it was easy to now minimize how many teams go into the bubble. For the NFL, there's no way you could do a full season with 32 teams in a bubble. Like, how many games would you be playing on one field? You know what I'm saying? Like, the games would have to start at 8 in the morning and end at almost midnight to try to get every team on the field in time. Um, not to mention, we're talking 53-man rosters. So we're talking thousands of guys living inside the bubble with coaching staffs. Baseball's facing the same challenges because baseball never got to start their season. So they've got to try to get a spring training and a season in for a full 30 teams when we, we already talked about Florida's locking down again. Arizona just locked down again. Texas is on the verge of locking down again. So NBA had that one small advantage of, hey, look, it's easy for us because all we got to do is just get these playoff teams into a bubble and we can pick it up from there. Everybody else has got to figure out how to play a full schedule, a full season, while also figuring out should we do it in a bubble or even allow these guys to travel. And you see Tom Brady out there having workouts out in Florida, and I'm a Tom Brady guy. Don't get me wrong. I almost respect almost everything Tom Brady does outside of the, you know, the little things with the plate gates or whatever. But um, to be working out at this time, I just think it's very, it's very risky, especially with the hot spot of the coronavirus right now being in Florida. Um, as an NFL football fan, I, I'm used to watching it every Sunday, and I'm just like you. I'm scared. I don't know if we're going to have a season. And if so, if we do have a season, I don't know if we're going to be able to complete the season at that. Yeah, yeah, none, of, yeah none of us knows. At this point, it, um, it's just so much going on where we don't know if we're actually going to get a season. As much as you know, we're all football fans on the show, and as much as we would love to see it, it just – at this point, it's too much going on to really say the only thing I could maybe um, that way they could actually accomplish a bubble. They just have to split things back up and make it into two bubbles, maybe one for AFC and NFC. And then it just, everything would just, they have to change the schedules and just make all of the games, you know, NFC versus NFC, AFC versus AFC. But even with that, there's so many people on the team. Like that's hard to say. Cause again, like you said, we're talking about 53 man rosters on every team. NBA, where you only got uh, 13 guys on the team, you know, maybe you got the coaching staff and the trainers, but when you add the coaching staff and the trainers to NFL, that's a hell of a lot that's that's right. going on. A lot of people, you got to have quarantine. You're looking at, like I said, the coaching staff, players, officials, um, the camera crew, you're looking at over 200 plus people just on that one field. Yeah. And, and, it's hard to practice social distancing when you got 53 men on one sideline. Like, guys have to communicate. Coaches got to come over and go over strategies and game plans. So it becomes very difficult. Um, and as Leo, as you mentioned, I think that might be their biggest fear. They, don't, they would hate to start it and then have to stop the season. Because yeah. for the NFL, then it becomes even harder at that point. Because if let's say hypothetically you, they do get to start in September. And then come November, they have to stop because we get this, this wave again. So then it's like, all right, so are we even going to get to start playing again before our scheduled Super Bowl? Because if we stop in November, are we going to be back on the field by January? You know what I'm saying? Like, what happens then? There's a lot of variables here, and I, and I, I think we should all be prepared that come September, if, there's, if football hasn't started, we may not see it for this year, for this season. And um, I don't want to take this, really, this opportunity, but at the same time, I do think it's important. Um, I just dropped a video called It's Good to Gamble. Um, the, the fifth episode, and I talk about this, about sports returning and in the NFL in particular, I think that, listen, it's, it's really, it's going to be tough for these sports to try to return. I think some of it is sports. Obviously, money has a lot to do with it. I think it's more about money than it is us like we, you know, with our jerseys on and, and enjoying this moment due to what's going on. 
yeah, they can use that as a as a lead rate to try to get the, these things going. But at the end of the day, it's about money. So I just don't want the NFL to start the season and have to – or people get sick and there's an outbreak on the team and they have to shut the season down. I think if anybody out of these teams, I mean, out of these organizations, have the best chance to make it work, it will be the NBA because I feel like they have a, a more sought-out plan and they are in a bubble, but there's a risk factor in that as well. Yeah. Well, and that's the thing. Again, the NBA, you know, there's a lot less people that you have to think about. So, you know what I'm saying, whereas especially now going in with the 22 teams, I mean, could you, to 22 teams and you compare that to the numbers, that might be, be four football teams. You know what I'm saying? And what you going to do about, about everybody else that's in, in the league? So it, it's definitely uh, going to be tough. We're going to have to wait and see, but it, but it's going to boil down to, again, it's that, that bottom line. And that's what, you know, where the owners are going to try to make those decisions because if you cancel the entire season, it's a lot of money being being left on the table that a lot of people was not getting. How are we working out those contracts with the players? Is is everyone still getting paid their full contract if there's no season? Like, there's a lot of questions that you have to answer, which I know the NFL doesn't want to have to answer. But it, if we're at a point where, you, you know what I'm saying, we just cannot have an NFL season, you know, I don't know, man. It, it's going to be tricky. Yeah, it's it's worst case scenario for them. It really is. Um, I, I've I've floated the idea out there several times, even when we were still in studio. I didn't think it was gonna happen this fast, but this these are the reasons why I think the NBA is slowly nipping at the heels of the NFL. The NBA just seems to have it more together, and they seem to have an idea of how to make things work. Um, if the NFL can't get a season going. It's almost a, a, a it's a big blemish on their resume because you would have thought, hey, you had all this time to kind of figure it out. Why haven't you guys could have already had your bubble situation taken care of? You know, you we knew in March that we were still going to be dealing with this throughout the summer. And so the NFL doesn't seem to have a plan in place. I think it's I think it's extremely hard. Um, I won't put the, the blame totally on the NFL. Yes, they had time to get it right when the NBA had to stop its season. All of us were saying, well, the NFL, we don't got to worry about till September. It was able to have a draft. They was able to have free agency. But some things is just nature. Some things is just um, out of your control, I, I feel like. Even the NBA, although the NBA have a more sought-out plan, it took forever to get that plan in place. And if you leave, even look at um, Adam Silver right now in these interviews. The brother don't look all happy to me. He don't look like he, he has it all figured out. You know what I'm saying? He looked a little skeptical and worried that things might not go as smooth as he wanted to do. I wanted to go, shall I say. So I think that it, it's a risk factor. I mean, you ask in the NFL a sport that I feel like you really can't put in a bubble to just make something work out of what's going on with social injustice and COVID-19. So I, I don't know. I think it's, it's more I'm it's, not, it's more about the NFL, man. Yeah. I, I'm, listen, I, I'm not saying it's, it's perfect because we know even now with Adam Silver, they still have some hurdles to overcome because he's openly said that they're worried about the restart at the end of this month because of the spike in numbers in Florida. And they, they understand that as well. But the same resources that the NBA has been able to pull together to get this bubble thing going, the NFL has those same resources. The NFL has their contacts with Disney. They have their contacts with every state. So when we say bubble, we know that it's unrealistic to think every team could fit under one roof. We know that. But there needed to be some strategy in place where the NFL said, hey, look, the teams on the East Coast report here. The teams on the West Coast report here. The teams in the Midwest, right in the middle, they report here. Here we are. We're already in July, guys. Like, under normal circumstances, preseason would have been starting a month from now. The NFL has yet to release what their plan is. They're assuming that they're going to be playing in every stadium across the country as if nothing is going on. And that, to me, is the bigger risk because, again, they're, they're – their ignorance to their sport and feeling like we're different than everybody else, we don't have to worry about those things, is now coming back to bite them in the ass a little bit because they don't have a plan in place to make sure that their season can start. Yeah. And, and you know, again, Adam Sandler, he's going to be worried in, in any way because and basically until everyone is inside of their bubble, he's going to be concerned, especially because of the spike in numbers in Florida. Um, you know what I'm saying? I, I, I will say, you know, then the NBA does have it together. You know, now it's just a matter of, you know, if this universe is going to coincide with the NBA's plans, but at least they do have that plan. You know, they've been they've been 
they've been testing, you know, all the players that are getting ready to go back in, into the bubble and have everything worked out on that accord. Now it's, just, again, like I said, now it's just whether or not the universe is going to say, all right, we're going to let y'all players come into this bubble and everything will be fine. Like I said, Eric, there's no plan in, in the NFL right None. now. There's, there's nothing that they have said or, or done that leads me to believe that they have this thing worked out. And when we're supposed to be back to playing, we're going to see NFL games. And again, you know, just the, the size of the rosters makes this thing damn near impossible for the NFL to even get inside a bubble, you know? So it's it, it's kind of rough. But again, you know, the NFL has been lacking in a lot of different areas uh, uh, recently. So we know that about them. Uh, we know, you know, even when uh, Roger Goodell came out with his apology, still hasn't even mentioned Kaepernick's name. We hear all this back and forth about Kaepernick, uh, teams being interested in Kaepernick. I haven't seen no teams call. I haven't heard Kaepernick say a team reached out to him, email, messenger pigeon, anything. So, we, you know what I'm saying, they, they're, they're lacking in that. Um, I will say this, Cap has been uh, speaking uh, more recently. Um, you know, there's a lot, a lot been going on, especially, you know, with the whole social injustice issues that we have here in this country. Uh, we just got past the 4th of July. I know I've been going crazy with all these damn fireworks for the past month outside of the crib to 2 in the morning. Um, but, you know, Kaepernick, he, he put out uh, some, some very uh, powerful tweets in regards to the 4th of, of July. And I know everybody, or not everybody, but a lot of people who's been out there celebrating. Um, but, you know, Kaepernick said that the 4th of July is, is, is just a celebration of white supremacy. Uh, what, do, what do you guys think about that? First, I want to say Cap ending up on the NFL roster, and I, and I stand by this point every time we talk about it. If you're going to give him a shot, give him a legit shot. Don't bring him in. He he shouldn't be treated as a, a token hire or somebody who's like, oh, yeah, we gave him a shot and we sat him on our bench for a year. Give him a legit shot. That's first and foremost. Secondly, I think some teams are even scared to bring him in because they know they're going to have to deal uh, with the questions. And Kaepernick, to me, appears as someone who, just because you signed me doesn't mean I'm going to stay quiet. I'm going to ask you the tough questions and I'm going to keep applying pressure until you guys understand where I'm coming from, as, as he should. Um, in regards to the 4th of July, he has a valid point, man. He has a, a very valid point. Um, I know white America does not want to hear this, but white America has to understand that the injustices that have taken place in this country for centuries do not go away just because we decide to celebrate a holiday with you. Simple as that. You know what I'm saying? We may celebrate a holiday because that's a tradition we were brought up on. As children, we didn't know much about the history of America because it wasn't taught to us in classrooms. We had to learn that from our family and close friends. So as kids, when we celebrated the 4th of July, we thought it was, it was cool because there was fireworks and we didn't understand the backstory to American history. So white America's got to deal with that. And they've got to understand that everything he is saying is true. And I, I support Kaepernick. And like, like I've always said, um, I think I, I wasn't always on board with feeling that it, it, it killed his career. I think there were a lot of factors why his career was killed, but his message was always clear and his message was always right on point. And so with this, I agree with him. I mean, when you look at it um, from this perspective, um, Colin Kaepernick, I agree. I'm, I'm on board with you. Um, I always was on board with Colin Kaepernick when he took the, took the knee, especially when he said why he was doing it. Then it gave me an uh, answer, okay, why he was doing it, even though people try to put the narrative of you disrespecting the flag, even though he clearly said what he said. We all know that story a thousand times. We heard it on all radio shows. So I don't got, I don't got to dive too much into that. But when it comes to the 4th of July statement, I do wonder um, how much Colin Kaepernick wants to play football, um, too. And I, I look at that aspect because there are teams that may be interested. I don't know. We had Anthony Lynn saying um, he fits our system. But like you alluded to, Trip, ain't nobody making the calls. Ain't nobody sending text messages. Ain't nobody bringing him for a workout, the little BS workout that they brought him in for last year. I mean, a couple months ago. I mean, come on, setting him up to fail. So, yeah, he's right on the statement. It is a sign of white supremacy. And obviously, being black and being white, you will look at holidays in a two different, in this holiday in particular, in a two different perspective based on your experiences in life. You know, I have friends that look at July 4th and say, yo, this is the greatest country ever, happy 4th. And I know for people like myself and what I go through and where, how I was raised and how I see the world, it may not be on that same, you know, greatest country in the world. So uh, he has a point. I'm just worried about um, how much does he want to play football and if 
any teams hearing this message will stray away because of the publicity that's going to come with him being on a roster, especially if he's going to be a backup. He's too popular to be a backup quarterback and have as a distraction on your team. Yeah, the only the, the only thing, you know, with that, like, again, and I, I support Kaepernick. Eric, you're absolutely right. You know, a lot of things – we just don't know, you know, I'm, I'm just, and I'm including everybody in this just because it wasn't taught to us, you know what I'm saying? So whereas as kids, you know, we were into the whole thing, yeah, it's Fourth of July, firecrackers, barbecue, get to murder. But, you know, as you get older and as you start doing your own homework, doing your own research, and you're like, wait a minute, now this, we, we shouldn't be celebrating right this because this is a lot of, a lot of guys who were, who were racist, um, a lot, a lot of guys who were sexist, you know, there, there's a lot going on all of these these men that that we're that we're celebrating on these holidays and in these and with these places these monuments and these tributes but uh, but a lot of these guys yeah we saw you know they did some some really good stuff but you know if you out there i don't care about how much good you did if you had slaves i don't care how much good you did if you was if you was out you know raping women because you know, let's be honest you know they were they were raping the slaves and so, having you know, nigga barbecues, as you exactly. as, as they said, you know, hang, hanging hanging African Americans. These are these are the, the the men, you know, including including the guys that are on the Washington uh, the, the, the monument, you know, up there. Like these are the guys. This is what they were doing. They owned slaves. They raped women. They beat people. They killed people. These are the people that you that you want us to celebrate. And you know, again, the Catholic is absolutely right. It is a celebration of white supremacy. I wasn't out there, you know what I'm saying, this 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 weekend. I didn't I didn't get involved and that's for somebody who's used to my family having barbecues every year on the fourth of July, having everybody come out, getting our little fireworks on. I'm used to that. Not this year. We haven't. We've been we've been we've been shutting all of that all of that down. Um, you know, I, I and I hope I would love to see Captain come back to the NFL and play and do well. I don't know if there's a, a situation where he'll be able to do that in just because again, you know. The, the teams, he's more than likely he's going to be a backup, you know, and you know, and even the teams that where there could actually be some sort of a QB com- competition, a lot of those guys are the, are the, are the high drafted rookie quarterbacks. Um, where I, I don't know if Cap them, they would bring Kaepernick in and, and you know take a risk of starting a, uh, their young draft picks growth because again, Kaepernick is getting older, one and two, it's been. Uh, three seasons going on on now yeah. since he's since he's played last, so it's gonna you know it's, it's definitely gonna be a challenge. Not to say he can't do it, but I personally I don't want him to come back and just and and and, and, and be bad or just be mediocre at best, or come in and you know you mentioned this last week, Eric, where he he's got a he needs to sign at least a two year deal because there's a good chance he might wind up sitting behind somebody on an entire season. And then what happens is he never gets to play. We never get to see him. And it's like, all right, well, you know, we gave him a job. So, look, we did our part. And then and then we just wash our hands of the whole thing after that. Right. And I've said from jump, if, if you're going to hire him, treat him as you would any quarterback and give him a legitimate chance. You know, you don't bring the guy in, expect him to learn your offense like this, sit him on the bench, and then the year's up. It's like, oh, but we're not bringing him back now. You know, especially not in this situation because we know everything Kaepernick has already been through. Leo, you brought up a great point, man. I don't know if Cap does want to play in the NFL anymore. And I said this when they did the workout. I think he has a passion for the game, but I think that he feels he was done so wrong by the league that now it's a, it's a point of now I'm going to just make an example of you guys. Um, and the reason I say that is, you know, when we talked about the workout and we talked about it on air and Tripp and I both kind of had the same feeling like, man, it was a missed opportunity, bro. Like you should have just went. I know it wasn't a perfect situation. No one is saying it was a perfect setup. We knew, as you mentioned. It was a clown it, show. It, it could be. It could be. But we also understand that when you want the job, remember, he has been petitioning for a while. I, I just, I'm, I'll show you what I can do. He, he released a lot of Twitter and Instagram videos. That was your time to do it. And you go there, and so what if they think you're going to be a sideshow? You go there, and you knock it out the park, and then you put the pressure back on them to show, I showed up, I showed out. So now what's your excuse? But when you change the workout, and, and mind you, people always forget this part too. The original workout was going to give them the opportunity to speak to teams face-to-face after the workout. So when you change the workout and now all those teams don't come, and then you hold this like pseudo press conference in front of everybody, it almost becomes more about you just getting a message out as opposed to playing football. And I respect that about Cap too. 
If that's what you want to do, that's fine, bro. Because at the end of the day, we we appreciate what you're doing. You know what I'm saying? Leo, you, you brought up a lot of great points too, man. I, I, I'm going back and I'm thinking about them now, man, because it's true. I, I say it all the time, man. This man had to explain a thousand times why he was kneeling. And white America still didn't get it. You know, for us, to, here we are four years later and Drew Brees to say, I won't let nobody disrespect the flag. Bro, whoever said they was disrespecting the flag? Nobody said that. But you don't want to listen to that. The people don't want to hear that. You know what I'm saying? So I support Cap. And if Cap says, hey, I really don't want to play, I want to continue to be an activist, I support that, bro. Because Cap sacrificed his career. Yeah, and that's why I, I honestly really don't fail. As much as we want sports to come back, as much as I want sports to come back, trust me, you're talking about a diehard sports fan that life revolves around sports 24-7. But at the same time, I kind of agree with Kyrie Irving, even though I don't believe Kyrie Irving should have been the one that say, say that message simply because he wasn't going to play anyway. I do believe with his message. I'm um, excluding him from it because um, at this time, right in America, we... A lot of people have been telling, using their platforms to tell white America what has been going on in all assets of life, in hip hop music, in WA. Um, Spike Lee do the right thing. Colin Kaepernick by taking a knee. Muhammad Ali. And yet they only see the, the, the athlete and not the message. They only see the games being played and the enjoyment and not the message. So how do you create those messages? By using your platform to say, listen, I, I, y'all ain't getting it. So guess what? We're not going to make this enjoyable for you. You got to feel what we feel. So that's why I'm not even, uh, I won't even be mad if sports don't return. Yeah, I might be sad a little bit, but for a bigger cause, then I think that, you know, this is something that players should entertain as well. Especially going on, what's going on right now, you can use this time to do that. This will be the perfect time because you also got the pandemic as well. Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. You're absolutely right. You know, if you have if you have that platform, you know, especially I mean, we're talking about guys that have millions of followers on on on, on social media throughout, whether it be Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, whatever. Guys that have millions of followers, and you know, what I'm saying, and they they do have that power to say, all right, well, you know, y'all love us when we're on the field, when we score a touchdown for your favorite team, when we throw the, the long long bomb down the field or we get a crazy tackle, pop someone on the team and, 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 and make a fumble. But you know what? At the end of the day, we got to go home from this uh, from this stadium. We got to leave this football game. And once we, you know, we take off this uniform and we go back to being regular black men, you know what I'm saying, in, in this country, we get the short end of the stick. So all that praising y'all doing for us when we're on the field, you know, that's all well and good. But then once we're off the field, you know, and we're, and we're back to just being regular black men, and, and we have situations uh, like we saw we saw last week, um, you know, with the, uh, the the linebacker from your team, Eric, from the uh, from, from the Colts. Um, Darius you know, Leonard, we, yeah. Darius Leonard, yeah. When we have when we have those type of issues, it's like, yo, what are, what are we doing it for? You know, um, and, and again, you know, it's a little, especially with football, because in the in the NBA, you know, we have, you know, we can see the players' faces. So they, they have it a little bit easier because you can see the, the players' faces. You know who they are. But in football, mo most of the guys, have when they have those helmets on, you can't really, you can't really see. You know what I'm saying? You don't know, you know what I'm saying, who it is outside of, you know, there's probably maybe a good 20 to 25 guys in the NFL where you could pick them out of a lineup anywhere. But for the most part, again, when we talk about a 53-man roster, how many guys on that 53-man roster can you honestly say, Okay, I know this guy plays for the Chargers. I know this guy plays for the Chiefs. This guy plays for the Giants. Because I, I, I know I can't. And that's what me playing Madden since I was probably 10 years old, I still can't pick everybody out that's on, 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 on the roster on the NFL team. NBA, yeah, I can tell you damn near everybody that's running around in NBA. You know what I'm saying? So, you know, it's just, it's just crazy. You know, all the praise that you get on the field, but then off the field, and you, you just go right back to being a black man in the United States of America. And these players, like I said, it goes back to player empowerment. These players should be able to use their platform and should use their platform to make these changes because I, me, real little, I could go to a park and say Black Lives Matter and be like, would you get this clown out of this park, please? Like, what he think he doing? But if LeBron James or Kyrie Irving or some other, you know, stars in, in the NFL or NBA came to that same park, everybody will be listening. So it's up to the, those people. They have the platform. 
A lot of people say, oh, we like to put stress on these athletes. Being an athlete and being a superstar, making it out of where you come from, has a lot that goes with that. There's a lot of expectations simply because a lot of people cannot make their way out of that. Because if you're not an athlete throwing a ball in a hoop or catching a ball or a comedian or funny that know how to tell jokes, chances are you're still going to be in that in that that um bracket of trying to make it out financially. Yeah, I mean, the players have to use their platform. Um, I've never been guy. I've never been a guy who felt like every athlete should because I understand every athlete isn't built that way. You know what I'm saying? There's some guys who are built for that, and then there's some guys who are like, nah, I just, I just play ball, and that's it. And I, I get it either way. Um, but in this particular instance, it is very important for the athletes to use their voice um, because of instances like Darius Leonard. Um, I can't think of his name now, but there was a player from the Milwaukee Bucks who was profiled a few years ago during a traffic stop. Sterling style. Brown. Sterling Brown. Um, yeah. You know, and then to the bigger issue of we don't see enough black and brown people within the front office of ownership. And so the game is draining everything it wants out of you, but then doesn't think highly enough of you to put you in a position to still be successful after your playing day is over. And we all know that that's how generational wealth is created because you put somebody in that position where they can not only take care of their family, but they can put other people in position. So the players have to use their, their voices. They have to use their platform. Um, I agree with you, Leo. I wasn't a fan of Kyrie being the guy to speak out, but I completely understood the message. And I think by him speaking out, it also put pressure on the NBA to come to an agreement with the Players Association because now we see them putting Black Lives Matter on the court. Now we know there are going to be messages on the jersey. So even though we may not like Kyrie for the message, he put the pressure on the league to say, we still got to have this conversation, even though whether we come back or not, we still need to talk. Yeah. And, and guys, I feel like guys, um, and not throwing any shade to guys like LeBron who may want to keep this season rolling, I feel like, um, and it's understandable. It's understandable. LeBron James' record, um, it shows itself. Whatever, all the stuff that he did um, off the court, he done more than a lot of people um, do. And a lot of people like Jordan, his GOAT argument kind of part done in the past. So, But I, I do feel like um, a lot of guys will want to play, and it's, it's, it's okay with me. But at the same time, I do think they're all bigger issues than they were. Well, definitely. I mean, l- listen – the NBA, you know what I'm saying, I mean, after the whole uh, Muhammad Abdul Raul situation, they have been a lot better. And, again, that's a, uh, you know, that's a whole completely different regime in the, M- in the NBA at that time as far as, um, you know, management, commissioner, and all, and all that stuff. There's a whole, whole different group of people. But in, in recent years, the NBA has been very good at supporting their players anytime they want to speak out against any type of social injustices going on in the world, you know what I'm saying? So, you know, with them, you know, I'll, I'll give them a, a little bit of leeway. But with the NFL, this is the, the perfect time. You know, like you said, Eric, this, there are no uh, – well, let me excuse me. There's like a 0.3% that's like an Asian minority owner in the NFL. But outside of that, there's no other minority ownership in the NFL. And I don't even know how at this point – to, to get some minority ownership in the NFL because at the end of the day, it's it's just a matter of whether or not I choose to sell, you know what I'm saying, my team or sell some some, some stake in my, in my team. And that's a choice of the owner. So I don't even know how, you know what I'm saying, to go about that. Now, as far as, you know, the GMs and the head coaches, this is actually the time right now where the players could make a huge difference with, as, you know, general managers, presidents, coaches in football. This is the, the opportunity that the players have where they could stand up for their brethren on the other side of things and say, you know what, we ain't going to play until the minority um, GMs is evened out, until there's, you know, an equal number of, of minority head coaches as they're all white coaches. This is the time where that type of a change uh, can be made. Now, you know, and I asked the question, the same question to you guys as well as far as the ownership goes. Do you, like, how can we actually make that change? Because the only the time we, we had the opportunity to to get some minority ownership uh, in was with the, uh, the Panthers situation a couple of years ago, and nothing happened with that. And, again, there are a lot of black people that have enough money to buy sports franchises. So let's just let's put that out there so just get people think they can't afford. No, there are a lot of black people that can afford sports franchises. 
I, w- I would say um, I was hoping um, it's a tough situation because, like you said, the owners have to find it in their heart to want to, you know, reach out and, and, and trust other people other than their own. It's easy to trust somebody because they look like you and somebody that don't and you don't associate with these um, other people. So I think um, the best case scenario for me, I was hoping Jay-Z, who partnered with the NFL when he made that partnership that I wasn't a big, the biggest fan of, and I'm still not the biggest fan of, by the way, I felt that if he was going to do that, he maybe, you know, there was talks about him wanting to own an NFL team. Potentially, th- those were rumors. I was hoping those were real rumors because he has that platform. Obviously, obviously he partnered with the NFL, so they trust him on a certain type of level. So maybe he would have got that opportunity and then it would have um, have a trickle down effect and other we people, other minorities would have been uh, able. Sports first though. Before he could, because this could be a conflict of interest, he'd have to sell Rock Nation sports before he could do that. But I, but I wouldn't mind Hove. Yeah, yeah. I, I think Hove, I think Hove will be in line. Um, Hove has always been very strategic in his moves. And so partnering with the NFL is always going to be part of something bigger. Um, I think, what the NBA has done and how they seek out ownership is, is a pretty good model because they'll have you come on board as a, as a low end um, minority owner with a team, you know, 1%, 2%, but they'll use that time that you're in ownership to kind of show you the ropes and also vet you out so that when opportunities come around, come around to actually own a team, they could see if you could fit. Um, that's how the Sonics unfortunately ended up in Oklahoma city um, with Clay Bennett. Um, Golden State's uh, ownership group, I believe, were small minority owners somewhere else before they got that opportunity as well. So I think that's a good way to do it, but we got to open it up, obviously, and we got to make it sh- make sure that it's equal for everyone to get an opportunity, not just the good old boys club, not just the white guys that you trust more. We got to open it up. Um, in the NFL, as, as you mentioned, Leo, that people are more tr- uh, trusting of someone who looks like them as opposed to someone who doesn't. Um, but I also think that it's about just opening up the platform. One of the best general managers and presidents of football that the league has ever seen is Ozzie Newsom with the Ravens. He got his start under Bill Belichick in scouting, you know, and obviously if you do the research on Ozzy, Ozzy was a tight end in the league. So he knew the game, but Bill also took a liking to him and trusted him enough that, Hey, look, let me show you the rope. So when Bill was the head coach in, in Cleveland, he brought Ozzy in and said, Hey, we'll start you off in scouting. And then slowly but surely, he worked his way up. And by the time the Browns became the Ravens, Ozzy became their general manager. So it's about opening things up. I'm not saying you got to give somebody the GM position right away. Let anybody show you that they can do the job. White, black, brown, blue, it doesn't matter. You got to show me you can do the job. But at least give guys the opportunity to show you they can do it. Because you can't tell me that with all of the black athletes we see in football, none of those guys are smart enough to do that job. I mean, come on. You know what I'm saying? But they try to tell us who they weren't smart enough to play quarterback. So I guess right, yeah, yeah, but we know we we know where that can where that comes from. But yeah. let's be realistic. We know like the Kansas City Chiefs probably have had the, the best offense the league has ever seen for the last few years. Andy Reid gets all the credit, but nobody talks about Eric Bieniemy, who's the offensive coordinator. You know what I'm saying? Eric Bieniemy was a former running back in the league. This is a guy who knows the game. But yet there are other offensive coordinators that you'll give the job to before even interviewing Eric Bieniemy. So yeah. we got we got to make it level for everybody, and we got to put the pressure to give these guys a shot. I think what it comes down to, you know, Eric, is I think, and it's, it's crazy, but I think, you know, I look at, at, at the situation and if you if you think about pro sports, right, and, and, guess, and just keep it with the top four sports, baseball, uh, basketball, football, and hockey, right? Look at the difference in the, the, the diversity of players and how it changed from let's say the, the 40s, the 50s, the 60s to where we are now, where you know you see basketball and you see in, in football, right? Where you know minorities have kind of taken over and baseball as well because baseball now you know it, it, Spanish the Spanish players have come in and they dominate you know a lot in baseball and, and I, I think baseball probably well hockey definitely has the most white players left but baseball will probably be second. So I think there's a lot of fear. In that as well, so I don't, you know, yeah, I, I do believe it's trust as well, but I think it's fear that you're gonna lose your place in in in, in this in this because this is big business. So if you think about it, right, you already lost the, you know, with the, amongst the players, you don't lost that because now where mm. African Americans couldn't even couldn't even play in, in 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 Major League Baseball, couldn't play in NBA, Spanish guys couldn't play in these in these sports, and now they dominate the, all of these sports. So it's like you know, then they come in, they kind of take over. 
You can't let these, these, yeah. these dudes come in now and start taking over the gym positions. And get I, I, I like your too. point. I, I, like, I think that point is a, a perfect point. I never really thought about it from that perspective. But you just opened my eyes just now. Uh, maybe they fear that when we get up to these GM positions and we have power, enough power where we can actually separate and start our own league, then they'll lose out. I feel like that that's a fear that they will have too. When a lot of these guys will have all this money and players will be like, you know what? We can, you know, start our own thing, our own league. Then that that could be something they fear as well. Absolutely. Guys Absolutely. Well. I mean, I, I'm sure there's fear amongst a lot of people um, when it comes to these guys are taking over, you know, like we, we want to only give them a little bit of the pie. To me, I mean, that still speaks to the issue because if, if we're trying to make this as even as possible, as equal as possible, then it shouldn't be a matter of this guy's going to take my job because if I'm good enough to do my job, I'm going to have a job. You know what I'm saying? Like nobody can go in and take Bill Belichick's job. He's too good. Right. Nobody yeah. could take Greg Popovich is, is, is very vocal, but nobody could take Greg Popovich's job. Exactly. You know what I'm saying? But now if you're a guy who knows you're not worthy of that position, but you were just given it because you're white or because of your connection, then, yeah, yeah you Greg might Popovich. be the guy. That, right. You might be the guy that's fearful. But if you're doing your job and you're good enough, you should never feel like somebody could take my job. But those, and think those, about, are, those are the guys. And but, think but, about all the guys that try to use Bill Belichick's model try to use his style, try to, you know, take a little notes mm -hmm. and see what he do. And they still can't beat Bill Belichick at what Bill Belichick knows how to do. Yeah, right. But, I, and that, but, that's but the thing. On, the, on, the, on the flip to that too, right? Look at Brian Flores. I think Brian Flores, for the, for the waste of talent that they gave him down in Miami, he did a good enough job to show you, I can do this job. Now just give me some talent. You know what I'm saying? Exactly. Too many times too, we, we'll see the black coach giving the bullshit job or the bullshit team with no talent. And then it's like, oh, figure it out. Figure it out. Yeah. And, and I mean, think about Steve. Oh, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah. Go ahead, Trey. Once you, once you actually, and you said it best, Eric, once you give someone an opportunity and we disprove the myth that you put out there that says that we can't do this and we excel, you have no choice but to continue to open up and let us in. That's why we spoke about Doug Williams earlier. And again, you know, that's a position that they said that black men could not play. They could not play quarterback, right? Now, if you look at right now, even just this season, this past season alone, the, the guys that had the, the top, which is, you know, the, that whole QBR stat, the top five in QBR were all African-American quarterbacks this past season. Your Super Bowl MVP, your regular season MVP this year were both black quarterbacks. Last year, your regular season MVP was a black quarterback. So we, we kind of dispel these myths. Look at what Rich Paul has been able to do as far as being an agent. 20 years ago, how many black agents were there, were there in, in, in sports, period? Let alone, mm -hmm. you know, just, just the NBA. Look what he's done. He, I, just, I just read out earlier, he, got, he just uh, picked up Trey Young. So he got Trey Young over at Clutch Points now. So he's doing his thing. So when you put these guys in, in a position, you know what I'm saying? If, if, if you're, again, if you're a Bill Belichick, or if you're one of those guys that are really good at your job, you shouldn't be worried. But I think that there's a larger percentage of people who feel like if we let somebody else in, they're going to take our spot because we're not as good as we claim to be or as we, the, the, the story tells us, you know, tells the world that we are. We're not, we're not as good and somebody couldn't come in and take our job because at the end of the day, we've known, you know, when, when we was kids, we was taught that, listen, you're going to have to work twice as hard as your white counterpart to get this job, to get this spot over here, to get this position over here. We already know we got to work twice as hard anyway. So when you put that mentality with just a natural skill set, intelligent and talent that we have, hell yeah, we're gonna start taking people out. Uh, but we, we run low on time, but we do gotta get into some some NBA talk, uh, you know, really quick. Again, you know, as we, we mentioned earlier, and we we what we always talk about the NFL and how how um, forward thinking they they've been. Um, they are uh, they they approved. Um, the, the messages on the jersey. So they have a, a list of different uh, messages um, ranging from I can't breathe to say her name. Um, I think there's, there was I think there's 27 different um, approved jersey messages in addition to uh, Black Lives Matter, which will be on the, on the courts um, that the guys are going to be playing on. So definitely want to commend the NBA for that. I, I love it. Um, Eric, we, we've been talking about things that the NBA can do 
if the players were going to continue to play. So I absolutely love this idea. Shout out to Commissioner Silver. Shout out to the um, to, to Chris Paul and, and the Players Association for coming together and coming up with some brilliant ideas. Really quick, guys, if you got a final thought, because we're going to wrap it up and get up out of here. Jaleel, we'll start with you, bro. Um, I would just say this. Um, you know, I dropped a video earlier. It's good to gamble five talking about the return of sports. Um, you can definitely check that out on Real Little TV. And basically what I dived into and what we pretty much dived into today is that we are dealing with a pandemic. Well, we're dealing with two pandemics, racism and COVID. So it's going to be interesting. And, you know, I like movies. I'm a big movie watcher. I feel like this is o almost like a movie. And it's interesting to see how the ending of this movie will turn out. Absolutely. Absolutely. It, it's we are in very unique times and I'm, I am interested to see how everything plays out over the next few months. Uh, hope everybody's staying safe, staying indoors, man. Uh, we appreciate the support. We're going to keep dropping content for you guys, man. And make sure you're following us on social media. Real fans, real talk. Trip Young, Legend in Two Games. Just just keep supporting. As a fact, make sure you hit that hit that website up because we got a lot of new content up there, new blogs uh, coming out, realfairsrealtalk.com. And if you're not in the New York City area, you can still watch the show every Thursday night at 8 p.m. Just all you got to do is go to realfairsrealtalk.com. There's a little red button right on the home page where you can click that and you can watch the show from wherever you're at in the world. Uh, Facebook.com forward slash realfairsrealtalk, Twitter, Instagram, at realfairsrealtalk, and subscribe to that YouTube channel youtube.com forward slash for the fans productions because that's where you get a little bit more exclusive with us because you know some guests we have they talk in a certain type of language where we can't just put on on, on regular television so we got to send it to the youtube and straight to the website so make sure you guys subscribe thank you again to all of our sponsors uh petro home services kmart the risotto firm uh soundview liquors big shout out and thank you uh to everyone for rocking out with us for myself trip young Real Lil Jalil and uh Legend of Two Games, Eric Sanchez. We'll be see you guys right back next week, man. We up out of here. Peace. All right, thank you. type of blend backing up misfit to make sure y'all tuned in you gotta watch this show is one of a kind updates on your tv screen from eight to nine for the older folks so even if you're younger no matter what sport this show we got it covered it's filmed live in the middle of bk so ain't no better sports show to watch on thursdays real, real fans show. real talk we as real as you thought real fans real talk we the illest of course real fans real talk we the illest of course real fans real talk we as real as you thought